Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Rachel Alvarez, Director of Operations for QCMD. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar. This is Ask the Experts questions submitted by the Lemma 2 CMD community. The format for today's webinar will include answers to questions that have previously been submitted by you all. Um, if at the end of the webinar you have additional questions, we will share an email address where you can submit those questions and then we can get back to you with some answers. Um, QCMD is also planning a CMD Scientific and Family Conference July 7th to 9th in Arlington, Virginia. This is another really great opportunity for you to ask questions, learn from experts in our disorder, as well as meet other affected individuals and their families affected by CMD. We really hope to see you there. So I would now like to introduce our host for today's webinar. Dr. Ronnie Cohn is the Chief of Pediatrics and a Senior Scientist at Sick Kids in Toronto. Dr. Hank Meyer, who is a pulmonologist and director of the Pulmonary Function Laboratory at Children's Hospital, Philadelphia. Dr. Gustavo diaz Chipolsky and myself from Kirsten B. Dr. Cohen, I will turn this over to you. Um, if you could briefly explain to us a little bit about what is LAMA2 and how it affects uh, muscle function and why people with mutations in LAMA2 actually have congenital muscle dystrophy. We'd appreciate it. Okay, thank you so much, <clears throat> Rachel, and I'll try to keep the introduction short because probably most people here know about the disease, so we can go to the questions because there are a lot of those questions and I would like to take time. But uh, as you can see in this, um, in this picture, Lamy Alpha 2 is a protein that's essential for the basement membrane uh, part of a skeletal muscle fiber. So if you look at a muscle, there are two very critical aspects, or let, let's say three critical aspects of muscle. So you have the outer layer, which is the basement membrane, that's then connected to many other proteins, as you can see here, to what's called the sarcolemma, with a very specific, specific uh, under the basement membrane, a special membrane of muscle uh, <clears throat> that is connected to this outer layer. Um, and then this protein complex you see there is then connected to pretty much the inner part of what we call the cytoskeleton of the muscle. And together, the connections of all these proteins between the inner part of the muscle and the outer part of the muscle provide the structural stability that is important for muscle um, to function very well. Now, when you have a mutation in lamin alpha 2 in the protein, then the connection is disrupted in a way that the stability of the membrane is not given anymore, which then leads to a number of different uh, problems in the muscle. But all of those, and we don't have to go too much into detail, in the end lead to weakness of muscle, loss of muscle fibers, and when the loss and when muscle fibers are lost, in this case, you have a replacement of scar tissue in the muscle. And the more scar tissue you have in the muscle, the weaker you are and the less muscle function you have. So that's kind of in a nutshell what the disease is all about. So when you look at what kind of symptoms you have, most of the issues resulting from the mutation in lamina alpha 2 are really to significant weakness of muscle. On that slide, you have hypotonia, which is low muscle tone, and it's true the low muscle tone, though, is a result in this case of the significant muscle weakness. And because of the muscle weakness, there are lots of other issues and problems you have, and we will be talking about those as, as, as the webinar continues. Generally, when you are suspicious of any kind of muscular dystrophy, the first test you do is what's called a CK test. That's a creatine kinase test. That's an enzyme that's usually contained within the muscle. And if you have a muscle dystrophy and some of these muscle fibers are destroyed because of whatever mutation you have, the muscle enzyme is released in the blood. And that's why you can do a blood test. And then with the blood test, you generally see a high CK level. The CK levels are generally around 1,000, 2,000 maybe uh, in the early ages. Uh, kids also have abnormalities in their brain, although I will tell you, although we'll be talking about some of the uh, questions you have around seizures, 
When you look at the MRI on this picture, you can see that there's a lot more white space there. Let's call it for now white space than you would expect to see. It really very rarely has significant impact on intellectual abilities. Um, and we don't really even know whether these are the changes that are associated in the rare circumstances when you have seizures. It's an autosomal recessive disorder, which means a carrier for a disease, and there's a 25% chance that when you have a child, that your child is affected with lamin alpha 2 deficiency. Um, I think we'll talk a little bit more later about the mutations. It can be quite difficult to fully assess the molecular or the genetic diagnosis, and we'll talk about this later. The other complications you have, mostly due to muscle weakness, are respiratory insufficiencies, and, and my colleague from uh, CHOP will, will help address those. Um, you can have feeding abnormalities and difficulties gaining weight. I'll give you some of my personal thoughts about this later. And then because you have a significant weakness and you have an inability to walk, um, you can develop scoliosis. And the issue around the cardiac abnormalities is really still uh, quite a bit would say controversial. I, I don't think that there's a clear uh, uh, understanding at the moment. There are a few cell case reports of patients with either full or partial lamin alpha 2 deficiency who have cardiac abnormality uh, abnormalities. It's for sure not a consistent finding. And as we go through the questions you ask about this, I'll give you my recommendation about how you should check for this and how should you make sure that um, you, you have your child covered in terms of surveillance. All right, let's start with the questions. What is typical for LAMA 2 CMD in terms of progression, mobility, and lifespan? So, I, as a general, it's in general, I give you uh, my take on the word typical. There's nothing typical in medicine. So, I'm very careful with this term. What we do know is that patients who have complete absence of LAMA alpha 2 almost never uh, have the ability to stand or even sit completely independently. I think that is something that over the years we have learned. If you do not have any expression of that protein, then you won't be able to sit and you won't be able to walk independently. If you have partial deficiency, then you're really dealing with a completely different disorder most. The lifespan is something which we know from other more common muscular dystrophies is going to similarly change like it has for others. Because if you look at what are the main reasons why children with muscular dystrophy have a potentially life-threatening disorder, it is generally because we are dealing with significant respiratory breathing abnormalities as children get older. Again, cardiac abnormalities are not a huge issue, uh, not, a, not a consistent problem in, in our patient population here. We have been able to get so much better with taking care of respiratory problems, monitoring for abnormalities early on, that I think anything in terms of lifespan is, is a moving target. And I think that children, that all of our children your children, which are your own children, and the children we take care of as healthcare providers, uh, really get older because we are, we are able to manage some of the most significant life-threatening complications. So I think the disease trajectory is, has already changed. I have at least two older boys in my clinic who are over 20 now, who have congenital muscular dystrophy, and, um, and I think it will continue to change. Next question is, is there any correlation between clinical presentation and type of mutation? The answer to that is no. So at the moment, no, there's no um, situation where you have three different mutations. What you do have sometimes, you have one allele, one side of the gene. So you always have two copies of a gene. And the one copy can have a mutation where only one single amino acid of one single nucleotide is affected, and the other side can miss or have a duplication of a whole bunch 
of nucleotides. But that doesn't mean that this is more severe or less severe than others. We actually have not been able to really do a genotype, phenotype correlation other than if you express a partial amount of alanine alpha 2, and that is usually uh, occurring when you have a mutation where the most of the time the what we call the, the left side of the protein, the internal side of the protein is still intact, then that is giving you a milder phenotype. But you don't really see that a specific mutation is more severe than the other. And that answers the next question too, whether you have a mutation in exon, like where you say here as an example, 6 versus 22, it has no impact currently as far as we know on disease severity or progression. So what signs should you look out for uh, for your child when you have a seizure? So truly, most of the time, if your brain MRI shows, quote, only the white matter, so the white changes I talked to you about earlier, then the type of seizures you see are very subtle and are the so-called absent type seizures. We'll talk, there's another question about this that we're going to address in one. And an absent type seizure versus daydreaming is, is easily differentiated by if you have an absence type seizure, you can snap your child out of it. If you have a daydreaming child and you go to them and you tell them, come on, get out of it, then you get them out of it. If you have an absent type seizure, then for a few seconds, you really have what you call also a staring spell, and that child then is gone for these two three, four, sometimes five seconds. That's how you dif differentiate. And, and although it's not like a bad seizure with shaking all over your body, it's very obvious you will see it when your child has one of these staring spells, you'll see that something is for a few seconds not quite right. And that will be um, my recommendation to you. If you have something like this and these episodes occur at least once a day or several times a day, then that's when you need to see a neurologist and do an EEG. There's no real correlation between whether your child's going to develop seizures or not. I will tell you, it is still a rare occurrence, unless there are a few children that have been reported, and I've seen a couple, that in addition to the white matter abnormalities, have actual abnormalities of their brain structure. When you have these abnormalities of your brain structure, then on top of this, you have more severe seizures than just the absence or the small uh, jerking seizures. And, and that is almost always the case. So when your child is being diagnosed with uh, lining alpha 2 deficiency, as part of the workup, you do a brain MRI. And when you do the brain MRI, and you would detect some structural abnormalities in addition to the white matter abnormalities, that's when you have to be a little bit more concerned about um, more severe seizures. Um, there's really no incident of ocular complications and uh, other than what can occur. And the rec recommended treatment for the seizures depends really what kind of seizure you have. There are specific medications you can use for either absence type of seizures or a little bit more complex type of seizures. Uh, again, also this has really significantly changed over the last few years. The amount of side effects you see with some of the newer drugs that are being used are significantly uh, less concerning than they were like five or 10 years ago. So this is the probably the most interesting slide. And I'm not sure, I guess, I'm not sure how much of a conversation we can have here. Um, it's really the cardiac abnormalities is something that we very, very, very rarely see unless you have already significant lung dysfunction. So if you have, if you have significant breathing abnormalities, and then that can have a negative impact on your heart. But the heart per se, as opposed to, for example, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the most common Duchenne muscular dystrophy, is only very rarely involved so far. And we see it probably more so in patients who have partial CO2 alpha 2, which brings me to the fact 
But I told you earlier that the lifespan of these uh, of all of our patients is changing. It could be, it could very well be that we haven't seen much of a heart phenotype because it may be something that is going to become a problem later, even independent uh, of any kind of significant respiratory abnormalities. So what should you be doing? I think the most important thing is what you should be doing is you should have an echocardiogram at the age of five. And then again at the age of 10. And then if you're, as long as your respiratory function is okay, even if you have to have interventions, then probably doing an electrocardiogram every two years is going to be sufficient unless you find some abnormalities in the context of uh, breathing abnormalities, and then you need to probably do it once a year. There are a number of different medications that can be used. Uh, to deal with potential cardiac complications in case they occur. So, although it's something you don't want to see, even if you find cardiac dysfunction, it's very well treatable. And there are different kind of medications. I see, should I, or should my start, child start taking Losartan? I would not recommend taking Losartan on a preventative basis for cardiac issues. I know that some of you out there um, have seen some of the research that has come out uh, of the laboratory of Dr. Joram Nevo, who showed that uh, Losartan is beneficial to a, to a number of different mice with uh, congenital muscular dystrophy. And I am happy to uh, and invite everybody who is listening here, if your child is on Losartan, so reach out to me, email me, and we can have separate conversations around this. At the moment, there are no clinical trials that would recommend any of this treatment, so I can officially recommend it, but I do know from at least a handful of patients who take it, and it doesn't have any side effects. Pulmonary function, it's the most critical surveillance you need to do in addition to uh, your contractures in your spine. So. Having a good and experienced pulmonologist is key to, to survival and quality of life. Regarding pulmonary and respiratory function. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the community. Um, I'll go through the um, uh, eight questions that um, were submitted. Um, and uh, give you um, not only my view, but I, what I uh, feel is sort of the universal view of uh, uh, those of us that have uh, interest and some experience in managing patients with neuromuscular disease. So um, for the first question, what are the signs and symptoms that breathing function is declining? I think they're largely nonspecific, but still very important to recognize. Things that would certainly get me concerned or if there's a more rapid decline in function um, than had been present in the past. The other thing that I uh, get particularly concerned about is if the quality of sleep is beginning to decline, um, and that can lead to, um, obviously, poor sleep at night, uh, less opportunity to rest and recover function, which then can lead to more difficulties during the day. Um, the other thing that I get worried about is how do patients tolerate um, the weakness that we all get during acute illnesses, even simple colds. Um, in many situations, patients that have uh, fairly normal function when well, when they get sick, um, will have a much more substantial decline in muscle strength, not just respiratory, but extremity muscle strength. Um, and from a pulmonary standpoint, that can make it very difficult to cough and clear secretions and can often take a cold that would otherwise be, you know, a three to five, maybe as long as seven day um, course in an otherwise um, healthy child uh, to something that can be, you know, beyond uh, two or up to even three weeks in duration. Um, so I think of uh, general uh, energy level during the day capacity to function, and then duration of illnesses as being you know, three particularly um, important signs uh, that respiratory function is declining. Question two, 
how and when should I start surveillance and preventative care for breathing function? So uh, I'll break that down into two questions. Uh, the surveillance, I think it's important to start from the time of diagnosis. That doesn't mean that from the time of diagnosis, um, patients with LAMA2 need to be seen you know, every six months. I think the frequency is largely based on where one is in disease. But at the very least, I think it's very important from the start to develop a rapport and a working relationship with either a pulmonologist or somebody that is experienced and, and willing to manage uh, chronic respiratory symptoms. In terms of preventative care, I think the single biggest factor is having the capacity to help with airway clearance during an acute illness. Um, as we'll discuss a little bit later, that's typically in the form of uh, uh, a cough assist or um, something called intermittent positive pressure breaths or IPPB, which is what's uh, commonly used in, in, uh, in, in Europe. Though in the States, we we uh, routinely use the cough assist, and I like to introduce that well before it's needed, um, simply because um, it, I feel um, that it disservice the patient if we have a discussion about needing airway clearance uh, during an acute uh, hospitalization for uh, a hospitalization for an acute respiratory illness. So I tend to be very proactive in introducing assisted airway clearance um, to cough assist, and some of that comes from just a subjective assessment of coughing you know, done during the history and then physical exam. And then also uh, asking about the duration of illnesses. And if it seems as though the duration of the respiratory illnesses is extending beyond certainly you know, seven to 10 days, then I get very concerned and often will implement assisted airway clearance. Um, next question is, does loss of ambulation affect breathing function? Um, well, that's a more complicated question than it might seem. Sitting down um, can uh, alter the depth that you're able to breathe, okay? So just sitting down versus standing up, the vital capacity or the air that you move through your respiratory system will decline. So um, you could say simply that when you lose ambulation, your respiratory function declines, but that's more because of being in a sitting versus a standing position. However, having said that, um, the extremity muscle strength and the respiratory muscle strength certainly can deteriorate probably in a parallel process. And so there's not exactly an inflection point that occurs once you lose ambulation that indicates um, a more rapid decline in respiratory muscle function, but certainly doing uh, pulmonary function testing in a sitting position for the first time compared to a standing position will, um, in most situations, mean that the patient will have a lower lung volume. So let me do a little brief introduction. Okay. So now we have uh, when my child isn't sick, and that's a very good question. Some of that depends on the residual cough function that one has, and we all, whether we're well or sick, um, have mucus that needs to be expectorated. Is when we breathe air in, it has particles of dust, other debris, viruses, bacteria that, in most situations, deposit on our uh, the mucous membranes lining our respiratory tract, and then to uh, the mucociliary elevator is brought up to more central airways. That um, and once you get a critical mass of mucus, you cough and clear it. So uh, if you the simple re, uh, the simple answer is that if you can't cough, then you definitely need a cough assist on a regular basis. But if you have enough of a cough to be able to move a small amount of mucus up and out of the respiratory tract, then daily cough assist is not mandatory. However, having said that, I'm going to back up a bit and say that I use the cough assist routinely before patients have needs for cough assist for airway clearance. And I do this um, to help with deep breathing to keep the lungs expanded and open and to help move the, expand the respiratory tract. Um, sorry, the respiratory muscles and joints of the respiratory system, we call hyperinsufflation therapy. 
and uh, I've done some work on this with my colleagues from the University of Cincinnati, specifically Dr. Hemant uh, Solani. Um, and we expect to be able to publish our work on Lambda 2 in collagen 6 myopathy um, sometime this summer. So I use just the breathing in part of the prophesis routinely uh, soon after the time of diagnosis just to maintain uh, capacity of the respiratory system. And then it's a very easy switch to doing prophesis during an acute illness. So in summary, I would say that uh, doing the prophesis routinely when a child isn't sick is appropriate when there isn't an adequate cough function to be able to move small amounts of mucus. And so the way you might be able to tell that is if uh, your child is continuously clearing his or her throat or has a sense that there's something in their more central airways that they feel they can't get out appropriately. The other part of that, of course, would be if your child goes from being well to being very sick very rapidly, meaning that it may, might be difficult to be able to tell when you need to start using the cosmosis. If that's the case, then um, I uh, uh, recommend uh, using the prophesis for airway clearance routinely. So question five, what influence does scoliosis have on pulmonary function and how should this be considered when deciding on corrective surgery? I look at scoliosis as an added burden on the respiratory muscles, whether it's just a simple curve from right to left or kyphosis, which is where you tip forward. Um, that makes it harder to breathe. When you breathe, uh, your diaphragm goes down and your chest wall goes out. And if your chest wall can't go out as much as it should because of scoliosis, then that means that it's going to be a lot harder for you to breathe. And so I feel very strongly that if you have scoliosis and you're clearly demonstrating um, declining lung function, I feel very strongly about uh, referring patients for a repair of the scoliosis. The question, however, is how to do that. And I think most orthopedic surgeons have shifted to doing procedures that are what we call growth sparing, which are not fusion procedures. And that allows a child um, with um, uh, one of the growth sparing procedures to grow arms and legs, but then also grow in their thorax and spine. And so I feel very strongly that um, proactively addressing scoliosis um, as it's beginning to worsen as opposed to waiting until it's um, virtually uh, unrepairable uh, makes a tremendous amount of sense. And with the new techniques, I think it can be done uh, much better than uh, we have been uh, offering it in the past. One, one final issue in terms of just considering when to do corrective surgery. I mentioned a, a strong theory. The one caveat to that is having access to an orthopedic surgeon that is experienced and comfortable doing that. The only exception to that would be if you have a child that is nearing um, the end of their growth spurt. So perhaps a young lady who is um, close to 13 years of age or a young man who is approaching you know, 17, 16, 17, or 18 years of age. In that situation, the surgeon may opt to do a more classic spine fusion. Question six is what, a, what is uh, recommended pre- and post-operative care for surgery? Um, I'm taking that to be orthopedic surgery, but we can answer it for, for, for both. So um, one of the issues, of course, that we all have after surgery is there's pain, and we control pain with narcotic magnesium, sorry, um, uh, which, and sometimes with sedation, both of which can suppress one's drive to breathe. Um, and for somebody that has weak respiratory muscles, that can often be enough to tip uh, a child towards um, respiratory failure, respiratory insufficiency. And so what we often do for patients that we feel are not necessarily uh, in the midst of chronic respiratory failure, but may uh, be heading in that direction is we will proactively fit a patient for non-invasive ventilation or BiPAP with both a nasal mask and try and identify pressures 
breathing in and breathing out pressures that uh, the patient is comfortable with so that it can be implemented fairly smoothly after surgery if needed. The other thing that's very important is to have the cough assist or a device for doing volume recruitments or deep breathing afterwards. And um, for patients without respiratory muscle weakness, they use a device called an incentive spirometer after surgery where you put a tube in your mouth and you take a deep breath and there's a ball that rises within a tube and you try and keep the ball within a certain range within the tube. And what that's doing is that's forcing you to breathe deeply and in doing so, uh, it uh, allows you to re-expand the lung, the portions of the lungs that you haven't been using during your time under general anesthesia in the operating room. So I think supporting respiration, um, which may just be transient while a patient's on narcotic The seventh question is, what are the signs uh, that daytime ventilatory support may be necessary? Um, and very good question, and this is assuming that nighttime support is already uh, is in place. Uh, I think there are kind of two things. One, uh, just a general sense of how well are you getting through your day? Are you able to get through school without um, uh, fatiguing? Uh, when you come home from school or work or in the midst of, uh, you know, classes, college, are you needing to take a nap? Um, do you feel like you're having difficulty focusing um, or maintaining attention? Um, any of those could um, uh, be a sign of having elevated carbon dioxide and respiratory muscle fatigue during the day. Uh, the advantage that you have, however, is that... Um, if you have access to a physician that has a, a way of measuring your carbon dioxide by uh, checking the end tidal carbon dioxide, it can be very easy to identify whether you are, in fact, in respiratory failure during the day. And during each of our clinical visits, all of our patients that have uh, neuromuscular disease and they're in a you know, portion of their disease where respiratory failure is possible, we uh, measure entitled CO2 during each visit. So we have that data that we can uh, use and interpret during our, our, our clinical visit. The final question is a very important one, which is when should oxygen be administered if ever? And my very strong feeling is that oxygen should never be administered unless you have uh, corrected any respiratory muscle failure, meaning that you're on a ventilator. It doesn't mean with a breathing tube. That can be somebody on a BiPAP. And if that's the case, and you still have airway, I'm sorry, have uh, low oxygen, then it's reasonable to consider using oxygen. But oxygen should never be administered in somebody with neuromuscular disease, in other words, respiratory muscle weakness, unless you're supporting the respiratory muscles. The other part of this is the most common cause of low oxygen is going to be problems with airway cramps and having mucus plugging or blocking uh, some of the airways in the lungs. If that's the case, um, it's important to try and remove that and not just put somebody on supplemental oxygen to make the pulse ox number look better. And so I feel very strongly that if somebody with a known or suspected airway clearance difficulty is having a period of low oxygen, we need to, in addition to giving the oxygen, then do aggressive airway clearance therapy to try and bring the oxygen level, uh, I'm sorry, the oxygen level in the blood back to the normal range without supplemental oxygen. How does CO2 play a role in uh, breathing function for neuromuscular conditions? So when your respiratory muscles are not able to breathe in deeply enough during a regular breath, then you compensate for it by breathing rapidly. And then if you aren't able to compensate for a low, the low volume of breathing in or tidal volume by breathing more rapidly, your minute ventilation decreases. And when that occurs, your ability to wash out carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide that the body produces, decreases. And then your carbon dioxide level in your lungs and in your blood rises. And that um, is what we call hypoventilation. And if that happens, 
there's, uh, from a simple, uh, in a simplistic way, there's less room in the lungs for oxygen. And so many times when that occurs, um, the patient will end up having low uh, oxygen because of high carbon dioxide. And the solution for that is to get rid of the carbon dioxide or help to remove it. And how do we do that? How do you get rid of the carbon dioxide? Oh, we get rid of the carbon dioxide by starting somebody on um, ventilation, by BiPAP, or if particularly severe, by invasive ventilation with a uh, nasal or oral breathing tube. Are there any other questions or areas of concern that we didn't address that you feel are important to know about? Um, I, uh, the one thing that I, was, I touched on briefly that I think is um, becoming um, much more appreciated is the idea of range of motion of the respiratory system and doing deep breathing to try and preserve uh, motion of the respiratory system with something that we call hyperinflation or raised volume therapy. That's where we use the cough assist or IPPB to deliver a large volume breath um, that helps the patient breathe well up above the uh, volume that they're able to breathe through um, routinely. And so it stretches the muscles and joints of the respiratory system and also um, uh, keeps the lungs expanded and open. And that makes it easier to breathe ultimately because you're keeping the muscles, the joints, and the lungs open and easy to access. Let's go through the gastrointestinal question. So why do you have abnormalities of your palate? It's really, again, a, a result of the significant weakness of your muscles. And in this case, it's the muscles within your mouth and within your face. So the way how our palate is shaped in part, once it's developed, it expands and shapes because of a certain baseline muscle tone and muscle strength. And if you don't have this, it's a feature you see in a number of, this is not specific to Dan and Alpha 2, you see this feature in many, many different muscle disorders because you don't have the strength to pull the palate uh, apart. It does really not necessarily have an impact on the palatal glands, and I think you, uh, so I mean, I guess the glands outside of the palate, uh, they're usually not affected. And so there are different recommendations uh, that different colleagues give about when you need orthodontic treatment. I will tell, here, I give you my personal, but I'll tell my own patients, and um, you can take that um, and think about it. As soon as, a child, as I diagnose a child with, with this disease and they have teeth, I actually send them to a dentist for an initial evaluation. And <clears throat> so that's usually around the age of one and a half to two, maybe. And once this first evaluation is done, I actually try to encourage my parents to have the dentist clean the teeth and observe the teeth teeth every six months. I know this is a lot, and I kind of know that most of my parents probably don't do it. But I do think if you have a pediatric dentist easily accessible, I do think it would be something I would heavily suggest that you do it uh, if you can twice a year. Now, generally around the age of four, five, or six, so anything between this, this, this two-year period, the dentist will or should refer you to an orthodontist. And <clears throat> depending on the severity of the palate being, you have a high arch palate and it can be very narrow and can develop dental crowding, depending on how severe it is, there is no specific age when you start orthodontic treatment, so it's different. But I think you need to make sure that you have an orthodontist at hand from the age of six latest. That doesn't mean you have to do anything, but you need to have somebody observe. You. Is the smooth muscle affected in lamina alpha 2? As far as we know, that's not the case. Um, I know of one of my colleagues who has done uh, some experiments in some of the mice, and and has looked at the smooth muscle, there is no significant smooth muscle abnormality as far as we can tell. And the issues we're going to be talking about in terms of feeding and constipation are not related to a smooth muscle issue. 
So here's a question. As we know from the effective community that can be gastric testing is how can we convince our doctor? Maybe you ask your doctor here to just listen to other experts and, uh, and, and if not to the expert, then they should be listening to you because like, again, it's not a lamin alpha 2 specific problem we are dealing with and we're going to be discussing in some of these next questions. It's simply a result of many different things due to muscle weakness. If you don't move much, it has an impact on your gastrointestinal system. If you have feeding difficulties as a result of swallowing difficulties, it has an impact on your gastrointestinal uh, system. So the issues are real. They are not necessarily primarily because lamin alpha 2 is causing some dysfunction in your gastrointestinal system, but the disease itself does. So anybody who is not believing you, why don't you send them my email address and let them let me handle that. What are the triggers for worse in GI symptoms? That's the kind of question what I'm not, what I wasn't quite sure what was meant with this. If, if the person who asked the question is here, then you want to put something in the chat room to explain what this means or even speak up. Not quite sure what you mean. It's the general issues I mentioned before. Lack of mobility, potential nutritional deficits and issues. These are the uh, things that can be the any kind of a GI symptoms. There is no specific time when you consider a G2. Um, in general, most of the children uh, end up with a G2 within the first 12 to 18 months of their life. And although it's a procedure and it's a, it's kind of a technical medical device, I actually generally highly encourage parents to go for it takes away a huge amount of your pressure of trying to get enough calories in your child or not too many calories at some uh, sometimes you, you have really a little bit of a control issue over the nutrition and I think that is something which is incredibly helpful and, and takes away some of your stress so I wouldn't shy away from it if you're concerned about it in the tube systems these days a the procedure is fairly benign you can do it fairly quickly. And you can use these tubes, so you can do water therapies and anything you need. Um, um, so I wouldn't be afraid of it. So the current opinion around fund application surgery. I don't know who was asking this question. It's a very complex question. My recommendation for that is the following. Number one, it's a surgery that I would only recommend to you do at a place where people have a lot of experience with this. The, the, the outcome of the surgery is really dependent on the experience of the surgeon who's doing it. It sounds like a fairly straightforward procedure, but it's not. And in the context of potentially already being on nighttime BiPAP and, and so on, you really want to be at a center that has a close collaboration between the surgeon and your pulmonary doctor. That is not something I would do um, uh, in a center that has no experience with children with muscle disease. So you may have to travel there a little bit, but it would be worth your while. And you're, you're, uh, when, if you live in the United States, uh, it's actually similar to Canada, you can get a referral into a different state if needed and your caring physician would help you with that. So, I mean, I, I guess that addresses both questions about the fund application. It's very patient individual. I can tell you, out of the number of patients I've had, no one had to go through this. And I'm kind of glad that I wasn't faced with this. But I've heard from another patient uh, of mine, actually in France, um, where the reflux issue has been so severe that it wasn't controllable and they had to do it. And they did it at the same time and had a good outcome. Okay, we should be recording. Let's hope. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Rachel Alvarez, Director of Operations for QCMD. Who uh, is doing quite a lot of research, as far as I know, around hypoglycemia in various congenital myopathies. And it seems by looking just at the numbers that there's a higher tendency for hypoglycemia. 
Um, I think most of this really is a result of potentially uh, having just a little higher risk for it because your body doesn't metabolize food as well as others. So I don't think it's a major problem. The signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia are the following. Depending on the age of your child, um, let's say anything from one year and up, usually children get a little bit jittery, they can get a little bit sweaty, and they can be a little bit tired and out of it. I can tell you, as a father or mother who knows your child well, if you actually have a child that is hypoglycemic and is so hypoglycemic that it shows symptoms, it's quite a bit of a scary picture, and you'll see that something is wrong. You would probably take your child either to a doctor or even to an emergency room. So it's nothing subtle that you're going to miss. A child that is hypoglycemic, it can go as bad as having a seizure and so on. Usually that's not the case, and I've never heard it. Uh, about a congenital muscular dystrophy child having a seizure from hypoglycemia. So I don't have a protocol by myself. Um, I'm happy to reach out to my colleagues at the NIH to conduct the study of hypoglycemia in, um, and to see whether they have any actual recommendation. I don't think they are even as far with the uh, advance in their research to have developed the protocol. I can promise you if there's a protocol available, we will make it available through pure CMP. Um, what kind of vitamins are recommended? So this is like always a tough topic, right? Because um, you read a lot about any of these vitamins all together, uh, and none of them, uh, or many of them, really don't have any benefit. But let's go through the ones that are listed here. All of the children I take care of at the age of six and up, I put on vitamin D and calcium, all of them. Uh, it's, I mean, I, I generally measure their levels, and if they are not, if they are not very high, which they usually are not, I just put them on it as a prophylaxis to not get into problems because, as we're going to discuss in a little bit. Again, due to the muscle weakness, over a longer period of time, over the years, the muscles don't pull on your bone, and that leads to bone uh, weakness and mineralization issues of your bone. So we'll try to, I try to generally count, uh, suggest to at least take vitamin D and calcium if the levels are fine. Um, creatine, look, creatine is one of these um, supplements it clearly has some benefit normal people. I mean, you know that people who go to the gym take creatine because they think it's helping their muscle. And I'll tell you honestly, actually, seven, eight years ago, I tried creatine for six weeks by myself because so many patients asked me about it. And I kind of thought whether I was subject to the 25% plus that we're all subject to, I don't know. But I did think I felt a little bit better afterwards. So. I can't, I can't tell you you should take it. If you want to take it, I'm happy. Email me and I'll tell you what dosages you should be using. I can't, but there's, there's no evidence for it, but it doesn't have side effects other than it's not cheap and it tastes quite awful. If you have a G2, then that's not an issue, uh, but it tastes very awful and it's only bearable usually when you put it into some kind of Swiss uh, type hot chocolate or so. CoQ10 is similar to creatine. There's a lot of evidence that it has a beneficial effect on your heart and maybe on your energy metabolism and muscle. But whether it does any good in any of the muscular dystrophies, I don't know. Nobody does. A lot of parents take it. It doesn't have a side effect. So if you want to take it, I'm happy to discuss with you what kind of dosages you can take. Collagen is something I actually have heard only once so far about from. Uh, a family who asked me about it, I don't know anything about it in terms of what the mechanism or potential benefit is. I would discourage that. Um, are there any publications on the expected growth curve? At the moment, they are not. Um, but it's a very good question, and I'm sorry I, I didn't. I, I wanted to ask Carson Bennerman about this. I will ask my colleague at the NIH about it because I know he's doing a natural history study. And I think one of the 
things that may come out of this is a different kind of growth curve that would help you and your pediatrician to manage expectations in terms of weight gain and height. Contractures is one of these side effects and complications you want to try to avoid as much as possible. What can you do to prevent and delay progression of contractures? Honestly, the most important thing here is that you have a very good physical therapist. Uh, one of the important things to mention is there is no specific physical therapy that you should be using that's specific for uh, congenital muscular dystrophy. It really is, every child is different. I have some children who develop contractures very early, some develop it later. You have to monitor it, you have to do the physical exercise, and most of those at the end, in the, or in the beginning, uh, actually just uh, are about stretching exercises. As simple as it sounds, it really is one of the most powerful initial exercises to do to prevent uh, contractures. So what is the best practice care for hip flexion, flexion contractures? Surgery really is only the last solution. You should only consider and do surgery um, if the if the contractor is so severe that it has any kind of impact on the little bit of mobility you have been. I just see a question coming up. Do you think that contractures are inevitable? Eventually, yes. So it's, I, I thank you for asking the question, Shaughnessy. So somebody asked the question whether uh, contractures are inevitable. I think this is a good question to ask because in the end, as much as I think you need to be as diligent as possible to try to prolong severe contractures, over time you won't be able to completely prevent contractures. But I think what you will be able to do is keep contractures uh, at a degree that would avoid surgery for as long as possible. And that I have seen over and over the children who are really diligently going through their stretching exercises usually have, if, it, if necessary, their surgeries later. And you should not use Botox. Um, so that, that's, a very, that's, that's a clear cut answer. You should not use Botox to release contractures because the, the reason why our children or your children uh, get contractures is because of weakness of the muscle. Botox is used in situations where the tone is actually too high, and it's true, if the tone is too high and it's pulling on the muscle in a wrong way, then that can cause a contraction. Here the Botox would release and weaken the tone. So you don't want to give something to further weaken your muscle. So what types of physical therapy should we be doing? Like I said, uh, most importantly, it's generally stretch uh, exercises. Uh, trying to make sure to keep the to deal with the contractors as best as possible. Marching training is something um, that I have not recommended so far. A terror suit. I have a number of children who have tried this. Uh, not every child likes it. I don't think it's something that is significantly necessary for you to do. Uh, but some kids do like it, and the ones who do like it, I think you can do it. The question of how you balance physical therapy with fatigue is, is an incredibly important one. I, mean, I can't give you the clearest answer other than telling you, you know your child best, and you will, you will know when your child is a two, three, four, or five, or a teenager who just doesn't want to do stuff, versus when they're really fatigued. And I have to tell you, when you think your child is, is, is done with it and doesn't want to do it, or sometimes, depending on what the current status uh, of your child is, it is quite painful to do physical therapy. And once you think you hit the limit of either fatigue and or pain, they need to stop. So I wish I would have a more clear answer, but I think just pushing your child through this, if they're completely exhausted and or in pain, is just not the right thing. 
So here's an interesting question from someone about the physical therapist is working on building strength. And is it actually possible to increase strength with nerves and deficiency? I'll tell you honestly that we don't know the answer to this. We do, we, there's a lot of evidence out there to suggest that muscle doesn't regenerate as well in lamin alpha 2 deficiency as, as it does in many, uh, in, in a non muscular dystrophy form because of the regenerative tissue. And based on that assumption, can you really increase the strength just by exercise? I'm not so sure, and most likely not. That doesn't mean, though, uh, that you shouldn't try it because the one thing we do know is that trying to do exercise on whatever remaining muscle tissue you have does not seem to have a negative impact. So you're not destroying further muscle by, having, by trying to train whatever muscle mass is left. How much of a benefit it truly is in terms of building strength, I don't know, and I'm a bit, I'm a bit on the fence on this. Uh, the question about the standard is similar to the question about the physical therapy. So I think over the last 15 years, uh, Probably most of the children I've seen have tried a stander. And I would say half of them love it and half of them hate it. And the ones who hate it, uh, I give them a fair chance of trying this journey for three or four months. And then they don't like it after four months, I tell them, you don't need to do it. Uh, it really, the question about the stander is really just providing a little bit more flexibility and kind of a different view of the world uh, for your children. If they, if, if they don't appreciate it and if it's too painful or too uncomfortable for them, I don't think it's something you need to push too much. I will tell you more recently, I've spoken to a few of my colleagues about this. And it seems that the, some of the newer versions of the standards over the last few years seem to be a bit more comfortable and children seem to like it a little bit more. There are no specific therapies for oral muscle weakness. Um, and I would not recommend electric stimulation, although I know probably a number of you have tried it. The, it it's the same argument that goes back to that you can actually build strength. I mean, the electrical, what the electrical stimulation is just causing a contracture of your muscle, right? It can be quite painful. Not all of the methods that are out there. It's for sure very expensive. It's not proven, and I generally don't recommend it. So bone health is um, something. So the question, the first question being asked, will we experience bone density loss as a result of losing the ability to walk? The answer is yes, eventually you will. And when should you start scanning and monitoring this? I generally start this between the age of five and 10 with the first, what we call the DEXA scan. And then based on that result, you decide how often you have to do it. If it's abnormal, I generally do it at least once a year. If it's if, if the child is below the age of 10 and it's normal, I do it every other year. And after the age of 10, pending a little bit on the status of the child every other year continuously, and then I start to do it once a year. And depending on what the findings are, that will then answer the last question of whether you need actually any kind of therapeutic intervention. I will tell you, if you have significantly decreased bone density and or even a history of fractures, that just can happen. And that's, by the way, for every parent listening here, it's not your fault. This unfortunately just happened. Uh, I generally prefer uh, treatment with whether it's Fosamax or Moniva and any of those but again, you need to do this with someone who has experienced treating children with this. Because there are some side effects that can be managed. And if you have an experienced physician who is treating children with these medications, then I think uh, that's something we we'll try to look for. Research. OK. So what are the results of the hyperinflation study, and can the rec uh, can the recommendation for daily cough assist be made to optimize pulmonary function? So the results of the hyperinsufflation study are in, uh, twofold. 
um, one, the um, impact on respiratory function uh, was modest, um, but still positive. Um, not enough to, uh, uh, to feel that, uh, to, to, to say widely that this is therapy for which there's a clear benefit. For many, many situations, um, saying that something has a clear benefit is often um, a, a hard um, a goal to attain. Um, and so while the study doesn't definitively prove the benefit of doing hyperinsufflation therapy, there is enough of a suggestion, in my view, in the data to support using it. Um, the challenge, however, that we found is that of the patients that were doing hyperinsufflation therapy, the compliance with doing the therapy, which meant doing two 15-minute treatments a day, was only 44%, um, meaning that um, you know, uh, 56% of patients were not able to do the full 30-minute treatment a day or the two 15-minute treatments. Um, so that may be one of the challenge, one of the issues that led to not having as significantly positive a result as um, we had anticipated. But it also does point out an important question, which is the uh, therapeutic burden on families and, of course, patients in doing the therapy. That's something that I believe we'll, we'll have to do a, a bit more thinking about. We chose 15 minutes twice a day. Uh, because it seemed like a reasonable amount of time, but uh, that may be uh, more than what is necessary. Um, and so when we finish going through the data, we're going to have to we'll, we'll come up with a uh, recommendation and that may be uh, considering a uh, more brief uh, duration of therapy. Um, as far as the omega pill trial, um, the phase one study is near completion, and this is done um, I have a, only a peripheral role in this in uh, reviewing the pulmonary function data. The study is being led by Dr. Reagan Foley and Dr. Karsten Bonneman at the NINDS, um, at the NIH. Um, so what they've done so far is they have been able to um, identify a safe and um, uh, appropriate drug dose from which they will uh, plan the next phase two study where we'll be able to look in a more organized manner at efficacy. Um, with the varying doses that were used in the phase one study, um, there was not um, a clear improvement in pulmonary function, but there was uh, certainly stabilization. And in, in my view, the study was not designed to really be able to show efficacy of the omega pill but uh, it certainly did not show, uh, did, did not show worsening. Um, and if anything, showed stability. And I certainly feel that it makes more sense to uh, go forward and, and really hone in on the uh, potential benefit. As to when it might be available for treatment, that's a loaded question that's uh, almost impossible, not possible, but very difficult to answer. Um, because once the phase two study is done, um, a uh, final definitive phase three study may be needed, um, and that will be done certainly with engagement uh, of the company making the drug, uh, Sanfera, um, with the FDA to determine what they would want to see to approve uh, Megapil for clinical use. Um, but um, I believe that's going to be a number of years down the road. I will tell you, uh, as some of you may know, there is a new commissioner for the FDA at least they have been suggested. Uh, I don't know whether it actually has to go through Congress. And this gentleman is somebody who has very tight, uh, um, or in the past had very tight connections to um, industry. And I think there is, there is some thought that uh, the regulatory processes will change a little bit. I don't know to what degree, but I think for sure, there is an awareness that it sometimes takes a little bit too long to try to bring things into the clinic. So I do hope that uh, whatever changes the FDA is going to go through will have that in, in their mind. If, even if, let's say, the results will be published within the next year and they are positive, it will probably take uh, a little bit time until it's going to become available. So we have to wait a little bit for the results first. Is the use of stem cell therapy being explored? Um, 
I don't know whether anybody is currently looking into this. I do know from a group uh, that has looked into this, I think about five or six years ago in some mice. At this point, um, there are no really active studies going on. The major issue with stem cell therapies in skeletal muscle for any kind of muscle disorder is that we can't deliver the stem cells to the muscle in an efficient way. I can tell you, for the parents here who are interested in this, there are many, many scientists out there who are looking into generally trying to figure out that problem. How do you deliver a stem cell and what kind of stem cell would it actually be that you should develop and that you should take and try to use as a treatment? Um, and I think once anybody figures this out in a really efficient way, then it's going to open up a whole opportunity and a horizon for many, many different disorders. But right now, nobody has been able to really identify what kind of stem cell. Mark, I see your question. i answer it in a second. Uh, what kind of stem cell can be used? So, so there's a question here, and Mark was asking, should you, would I recommend harvesting stem cells from siblings that are born after your child with Lama too? I'll tell you, um, I'm not shying away generally from difficult questions in my clinic because there are so many. I find that one of the most toughest questions, and I'll tell you why. Because I've gone through my, I don't know, 15, 17 years of practicing, I've gone through several cycles of answering this question every time a little bit differently. So there was a long time where I told families, I don't really see any reason for you doing this, you have money for this, uh, and a lot of companies make a lot of money. So now I have been, I have to be honest, that I have slightly changed my mind about it because although there, there is no evidence at the moment, so I want to make it very clear, there is no evidence at the moment that these cells are in going to be beneficial one day. I do think that with the new technologies, and I'll talk about our, our own lab and other people's CRISPR work, whether we will one day be able to modify these cells potentially in a way that genetically that we can actually deliver them in a successful way. I'm a bit more hopeful, I guess, throughout the last couple of years than I was before. I urge any of you to not go into financial difficulties for doing this. Um, but um, again, I think if you, if, you, if you have the financial means to do it, it might not be a bad thing. But again, it's a, it's a difficult question. It's a tough one. So now the last question. So do we, um, so I, I guess I'm going to talk to you about mostly the wonderful work she has been doing on her own. And she has been supervising because we are really doing two things in our laboratory right now. The one is uh, where Dwi has been working uh, with the dy 2 j mice. So this is the natural occurring mouse model that carries a certain mutation. Uh, <clears throat> and she has been incredibly clever because she has developed a methodology with the CRISPR where she cut out a piece of DNA and kind of tricked the cell into thinking, how can we kind of remake the exon 2 that's missing in these mice? And she has really successfully done this in a way uh, that she um, delivered the CRISPR construct in an adeno-associated virus, the serotype 9. That's the one that's currently in already some clinical trials uh, without any significant side effects. And, and I don't use the word cure very often, although I guess I'm talking about cure CMD here, but um, she really has had remarkable results in making these mice better. So some of you may have seen at meetings before that these mice generally around the age of three to four weeks start already limping and, and are visibly sick, um, more so than many other muscular dystrophy mice. And uh, after, after she has treated them with CRISPR, uh, they are jumping around, they literally are jumping. We are just in the final stages to 
we put our paper together with some more data. We have it, had it already submitted. So I hope that it will be out there. Uh, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, optimistically speaking, in the next few months. I the other thing we are doing in our laboratory, and that's really, uh, so Dwi is uh, also supervising together with myself and another colleague, a new student in my laboratory for the last about year, a little bit more than that, who is looking into upregulating uh, another gene called lamin alpha 1 that has previously been shown by a colleague, mainly by a colleague of mine in Sweden, uh, whom some of you probably know, Navi Durbiche, that if you upregulate lamin alpha 1 instead of lamin alpha 2, then you actually can uh, circumvent and, and, and treat a number of the issues with this gene and protein. So we have a student who used the CRISPR technology where you inactivate the Cas9, which is the cutting enzyme. So you, so you inactivate in a way that it's not going to cut anywhere, but the CRISPR still goes to a place in the gene where it upregulates the expression of lambda alpha 1. And he has just finished uh, a first trial of where he injected this just in the muscles of the mice. And there are lots and lots of beautiful, positive um, fibers that express the lamin alpha 1 protein. That's incredibly promising. The advantage of this one, as opposed to fixing a specific mutation, is that upregulating lamin alpha 1 would be universally beneficial for everyone, independent of what kind of mutation they have. So I need to be, I, I want to manage expectations here that we are really, literally just at the beginning of this. But it's incredibly promising, and I can tell you that we and, and our student, Prab, had a big smile on their face together with me uh, when we saw the initial promising results. So we're going to do a lot of experiments now, given this systemically, and uh, try to see how much of the phenotype we can improve in these months. Okay, so are there any other, are there other countries in the world that seem to be a bit more progressive in developing treatments because of the lack of regulations? I would say no, Mark. Um, are, there country, are there people in other countries who claim that they have therapies, something like stem, mainly, it's mainly around the stem cell area? Um, the answer to that would be yes. And it's probably one of my biggest fears always in a deal with families who have potentially the financial means or are about to try to get financial support to go either to Mexico or India. These are usually two countries or Russia uh, to go for stem cell therapies. And, and I have to tell you that is something I, I really heavily object. This, you know, there's one thing about thinking about whether you want to take creatine and whether you want to take supplements. Uh, in, in collaboration with your physician, that's that's okay. But doing a stem cell therapy, that's a that's a significant intervention that has a lot of side effects in itself. And if it's not proven, I would I would urge any of you to please not go for this. But there's no country that I think is significantly further advanced with research due to less regulation. Not even China. Maybe that's the country you were thinking about. Uh, the, the regulations in China are a little bit different and are not quite as rigid when it comes to animal experiments. But when it comes to people experiments, it's probably not quite as less rigid as people think. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time today. And many sure. thanks to the Lama 2 community for the questions. We really appreciate those as well. Um, if you find that you have additional questions or comments uh, after we've ended this webinar, please absolutely get in touch with us. This email address comes directly to me. And if it's a question I cannot answer, I will definitely get in touch with Dr. Cohn or one of the other colleagues uh, who has been working on LAMA2. Um, I think that's all we have today. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel, for helping to organize it. If you have any, any questions, just you can email me directly. Thanks so much, everybody, and I hope you have a lovely afternoon. You too.